Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Kaneen, and I'm the Commissioner for North Asia for the state of Victoria in Australia. Perhaps you know we're Melbourne's. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the native lands upon which we're all standing and recognize their leaders, past, present, and emerging. As many of you are aware, the Nichigo Global is a collaborative initiative between the five state governments, JETRO, AJBCC, Innovation Dojo, and the Consulates General of Japan in Sydney and in Melbourne. I'm pleased to introduce the second webinar of the series, which will focus on the life sciences sector. Australia has a wonderful ecosystem for medtech, and Victoria is proud of its capabilities in this area, which is why I'm delighted for our state to lead the preparations for this webinar. First up on the agenda, we have Connie Christafi, Executive Director, Innovation and Medical Research from the Victorian Government. Connie will outline the life sciences ecosystem in Australia and broadly talk about our capabilities in Victoria as well. We will then hear from five companies operating in the medtech sector, nominated by each of the participating states. I'm very pleased to have Consul General Shimada from the Consul General of Melbourne here with us today, who will provide closing remarks. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Connie Christafi to take us through the first presentation. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Adam. Um, so today I'll be providing you with a brief overview of the Victorian health technology sector, our capabilities and competitive strengths, and what makes Victoria an attractive investment destination. Before I do so, I just wanted to paint a very brief overview of the Australian landscape. So Australia offers an end-to-end -end solution for research and development, clinical trials through to medical technology, biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. Nationally, we have a growing and globally competitive health and life sciences industry. We have a well-known health system providing excellent patient outcomes through quality healthcare. There are significant and wide ranging opportunities for collaborators, investors and partners alike in the national health, medical research and life sciences industry. Coupled with these opportunities, Australia is also a business friendly environment achieved through stable economic environment, very close ties to Asia, a well regarded IP protection and regulatory environment, a favourable research and development tax incentive and a highly skilled workforce. So uh, bear with me, I am just going to bring my presentation up. Now, I presume everyone can see that. Um, so turning our attention to Victoria. So Victoria's, Victoria has a competitive health and medical research system catalyzed by Victorian government investment that began more than 20 years ago. Despite the disruptions presented by COVID pandemic, the sector continues to grow. Our sector in Victoria- Can you make it slideshow? So oh. that we can see the slide better. Thank you. Click the slideshow it. up. That better? Yes. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's not a bit better. We, I can see that it, it's a presenter's view. Right. Um, Is that good? No, it's not a good. Oh. Um, can you just stop? Can you, uh, just close the file. Yeah, that, that's better. Okay. If you feel comfortable, please go on. Is that better? Uh, no, 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 no. It's a, uh, no, just a slide. Can you see the slideshow sign uh, up screen? Click the slideshow and start. That's going to be better. Okay. No problem. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. No. Let's go on. Yeah. Okay. Um... All right, so turning our attention to Victoria, despite the disruptions caused by the COVID pandemic, the sector continues to grow. 
The Victorian sector employs more than 31,000 people and we have more than 2,000 local and international businesses based in Victoria. We have a skilled workforce available for commercial manufacturing and a globally recognised research and clinical workforce experienced at working with industry partners. The sector is supported by 22 medical research institutes, 11 teaching hospitals and nine universities. Victoria's health tech exports are valued at over $3.5 billion and about two thirds of our export of health technology products are pharmaceuticals. This export performance makes Victoria's, Victoria Australia's largest exporter of pharmaceutical goods. So Victoria is also Australia's largest commercial health technology hub, being the home for many of Australia's commercial companies. This slide illustrates the market capitalization of Australia's listed <coughs> health technology companies, with more than half of which more than half is located in Victoria. Victoria is home to 77 Australian stock exchange listed medtech and pharmaceutical companies that have a combined market capitalization of around $152 billion. This slide shows the historic record of Victoria's success in winning competitive medical research funding from Australia's medical research agency, the National Health and Medical Research Council. Victoria continues to lead Australia in its attraction of this competitive grant funding, consistently receiving over 40% of competitive funding for research over 20 years. This result reflects the high quality of the research conducted at our research institutes. Australia and indeed Victoria provides a competitive opportunity for companies seeking to begin their clinical trials. Victoria conducts more industry-sponsored phase one clinical trials than any other Australian state. Some of the compelling reasons that have driven global companies to increasingly outsource their early phase clinical trials to Melbourne include, <laughs> firstly, cost efficiency. Victoria has access to attractive research and development tax incentive, including cash rebates. Secondly, speed. The clinical trial process allows flexibility without compromising quality, avoiding duplication, saving time and money. And thirdly, quality. Australian clinical data and results are accepted by international regulatory agencies, including the US Food and Drug Administration and European Medicines Agencies. Victoria also has considerable strength in infectious disease and immunology, which responded and assisted during the COVID-19 pandemic in vaccine development, diagnostic testing and antiviral drug development. The Australian Institute of Infectious Disease is a new visionary initiative of the University of Melbourne, the Doherty Institute, the Burnett Institute, with the support of a $400 million investment from the Victorian government as a major, as a major supporting partner. The vision is to establish the Australian Institute for Infectious Disease as a collaboration involving world-leading medical research and public health organisations in Victoria. The new $564 million Victorian Heart Hospital is a partnership between the Victorian government Monash Health and Monash University. It will be the first of its kind in Australia. The Victorian Heart Hospital will be dedicated to the specialised care of cardiac disease and will enhance our competitive strengths in cardiac care, research and education. The Heart Hospital has also been designed to facilitate clinical trials and engagement with industry stakeholders including access to research platforms, industry and academic networks, early stage product development and validation, 
and conducting discovery research. The building works of our new Victorian Heart Hospital is due to be completed at the end of this year. The Victorian government has established mRNA Victoria to accelerate new opportunities in Victoria's existing capabilities in mRNA research. Victoria will become the first place in Australia to manufacture mRNA vaccines after having secured a partnership between the Victorian government, the Commonwealth government and Moderna that will see Moderna establish a commercial scale vaccine facility in the state of Victoria. The facility will have the capacity to produce 100 million vaccine doses each year for COVID-19 and for other diseases like the seasonal flu. Breakthrough Victoria is supported by the Victorian government and will be investing $2 billion over the next 10 years. Breakthrough Victoria is charged with transforming innovations into real world applications and businesses that can sustain the economy, create jobs and improve lives. Specific sector focuses will include health and life sciences, advanced manufacturing, digital technologies, agri-food and clean economies. The Australian MedTech Manufacturing Initiative is a new $20 million Victorian government initiative to support the growth and competitiveness of our MedTech sector. The sector has three strategic priorities. Firstly, to grow the local med tech innovation and, manufacture and manufacturers in health procurement. Secondly, to grow the Victorian med tech manufacture, manufacturing sector, creating new demand and supply side capabilities and capacity. And thirdly, to drive connectivity and collaboration, including across government, industry, health, manufacturing and global partnerships. Victoria's competitive med, med tech strengths makes, our, makes it an attractive investment location for our international partners. We, have an, we are an ideal R&D location for med tech, pharmaceutical development and digital health solutions including access to highly skilled clinical specialists and a domestic market align, aligning investment opportunities with the highest burden of disease, including areas such as oncology, cardiovascular disease and mental health. Secondly, we are a low risk and efficient place to pilot and benchmark early stage med tech solutions for scaling to global growth markets including a strong healthcare consumer ecosystem, dynamic markets and regulatory frameworks that ensure technologies developed and piloted in Australia are scalable to major global markets. And finally, we have a robust healthcare system that is attractive for global partners and collaborators. It has a strong culture of innovation and we have a world-class medical research environment. So in summary, we're able to offer end-to-end -end med tech capabilities from research and development and clinical trials to commercial production and manufacturing. So for my last slide, I just hope that today's presentation gave you a flavor and some insights into the competitive strengths of Victoria's health tech sector. Victoria already has a long and strong history of partnership with Japan through our sister state relationships, but also our health technology commercial companies are also working together across a broad range of areas, including pharmaceutical development, regenerative medicine platforms and nanotechnology. We look forward to our continued collaborations, including in emerging opportunities such as robotics and personalized medicine. There are also great opportunities to co-locate in Victorian precincts for our Japanese startups and scale-ups. 
We look forward to the continued collaboration and welcome through Adam Kaneen and his team progressing these opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. And um, I think it's important to note there uh, as well, uh, most definitely, that in Australia, every state has a fantastic infrastructure and ecosystem which joins together. We're going to hear some fantastic new new um, technologies from all states from uh, from Australia. And I just add another couple of points, and that is that the National Health and Medical Research Council, NHMRC in Australia, provides 600 million, more than $600 million worth of grant money for research and development to all of the states in, in Australia. So there's, there's a strong federal underpinning to the, to the research developments in all of the states, which are great choices in Australia. And indeed, uh, the, the federal uh, Department of Industry also runs um, something you may, you may hear about today, I'm not sure, the research and development tax rebate system which assists companies depending on their scale and their, and their the intensity of their research and development with a tax rebate of between 8.5 and 43.5% of the tax bill for the research and development components. So there are a lot of really good reasons that Australia federally and, and, and state by state is a very attractive opportunity. Okay, so we're going to now proceed to hear the company presentations. We're going to hear from RhinoMed, the Victorian company, Prospection from New South Wales, Dollar Orthotics from Queensland, Fusitec 3D from South Australia, Argenica Therapeutics from West Australia. And we're going to start by hearing from Mr. Peter Jordan, the Vice President of Business Development from RhinoMed in Victoria. Peter, would you take it away, please? Yeah, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Australian state governments, uh, to JETRO, uh, the Australian Japan uh, Business Cooperation Committee, Consul Generals of Japan, and all the other organisations and individuals who are supporting the Nichigo Global uh, J-Bridge webinar series. Um, now I'll share my uh, presentation here. Just bear with me. I'll put it into presentation mode here. And hopefully you can see that. Um, so RhinoMed is a wearable nasal technology company with a range of products uh, that radically improve the way we breathe, sleep, diagnose disease, take medication and maintain our health. So I'll, I'll take you through some of those products. Um, uh, so uh, Ronamed products have been worn comfortably and safely since 2016. Um, and, and our major product, which is a nasal stent that people wear to help them breathe while they sleep is a product called Mute. Uh, it is sold largely in, uh, in, in the US, which is our biggest market. And we've had over 300, uh, over 30 million nights of, of use of mute. Um, and for most people that wear mute overnight, it, it reduces their snoring. So we have great success in, in reducing people's snoring with our nasal stent product called Mute. Very, very comfortable to wear and, uh, and, and really changes the life of many, many people. Uh, we are a listed company, uh, so we're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. We've got a listing on the US OTCQB exchange as well. Um, and we have a range of different product categories. So uh, the, the new product I talked about with you is part of our consumer health business. We have started a new product uh, category under our clinical, um, with clinical products. And that's the one I'll demonstrate to you today um, for a new way of sampling for nasal sampling. Uh, and we're moving into drug delivery and, uh, and diagnostics as well using our, our nasal platform. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have very, very strong uh, growth, revenue growth 
um, and you'll see in financial year 2022, we've started to see some of that revenue come in from our latest product, which is the Rhino Swab product. Um, key markets at the moment are, um, are focused in the US, the UK and the Australian market with the US market being um, their most significant. Um, we have a presence in over 20,000 uh, pharmacies uh, throughout the US through our channel partners, um, our, our pharmacy partners, such as Walgreens, CBS, Rite Aid, and, and other, other partners. We also uh, have a significant volume uh, through, through Amazon and, and the digital channel as well. But of course, now we're looking for market entry opportunities uh, in, uh, and product development partnerships, particularly in Asia and in Japan, particularly with uh, Japan's large population, sophisticated health system, and the free trade agreement between Australia and, and Japan. Um, so I'm now gonna just turn off the sharing the slides um, because I wanna do a demonstration of RhinoSwab. Um, so let me just uh, stop sharing and I'll be able to demonstrate that, that to you. So when the COVID pandemic hit and we're all being stabbed in the brain with, with one of these, which is a, a standard nasal swab, being a wearable nasal technology company, uh, RhinoMed knew that we could uh, come up with something that was not only more comfortable, but it was actually a superior way of taking a nasal sample. So, uh, so we came, we invented the Rhino swab, and it's a radically different uh, type of nasal swab. Now I'm going to demonstrate it to you here. So as you can see, it's one of the, the thing about Rhino swab. It's it's a self collection. So it's very easy for people to, to pop it in their nose. So it doesn't require a healthcare worker with a lot of skill uh, to, to, to take the nasal sample. It allows people to self-sample and there's huge benefit in, in that. So not only allows them to self-sample, but to get a reliable sample. And as you can see, the, the flocked area of the rhino swab is significantly larger than a standard swab. So that allows us to collect a larger sample. And that's really important if you want a high accuracy in your diagnostics is, is to have the best possible sample. Uh, very much like a standard swab, uh, it, uh, it breaks off into a tube, which I'm, I'm showing you here. So it has a break point on it, and then it can go off to, uh, to the pathology lab, right? So. So it solves many, many problems of the long stem swab. Uh, it's more comfortable, which is very important to people in Japan. Many people in Japan are using uh, saliva as a preferred method of getting a sample for COVID, for example, um, because of the discomfort of the current swab. So, so rhino swab could be very, very applicable to Japan. But a nasal sample is a superior sample to, to um, a saliva sample in most, most instances. Uh, now, we of course know that adults don't like being swabbed and we've all been swabbed probably multiple times during COVID. You can imagine that children uh, uh, actively avoid being swabbed. Uh, it's very traumatic for children and parents don't take them for testing because of the um, because of uh, the aversion or because they're afraid of the swab. So we came up with the Rhino Swab Junior, which I'm going to show you now, uh, which, as you can see, has uh, the novelty moustache. Uh, and children can, can swab themselves. So many, many children, as, as young as four or five, are able to easily insert the Rhino Swab uh, with the help of, the, of their parents, of course, or a healthcare worker. So Rhino Swab has been through, uh, Junior has been through um, a clinical trial at the Royal Children's Hospital. It's shown to pick up all the respiratory uh, diseases um, and it, it comes in different types of um, novelty. So we've got the, the koala, we've got the moustache uh, and we have, have lips as well. Uh, so Rhino Swab Junior, uh, helps children not be fearful of the swab, collects a better sample, allows them to collect the sample um, themselves. So it gives children a sense 
of empowerment rather than the healthcare worker or their parents coming at them with the swab. Uh, so it's less intrusive more and, and more comfortable and pain-free. Uh, and importantly, it works with both molecular testing, such as lab testing, but it also works with, um, with antigen tests. Um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the, to the slide because I wanna show you uh, some of the, the antigen tests that uh, we're working with. So hopefully you can all see the, the slide again. So I'm just gonna continue on with that. So you can see here the Rhino Swab Junior and all the different types of novelties we have. You can see that we've been through a successful trial with the Royal Children's Hospital. You can see that we can use it for um, adult and children's for both molecular testing and for rapid antigen testing. You can see that. Um, and it's now in the market. It's been very successfully received in the market. Uh, and one example of that is a recent um, supply agreement for a rapid antigen test company in Canada called BTNX. Um, so BTNX is the leading supplier of rapid antigen tests to the Canadian government um, with over 350 million uh, tests um, sold to the Canadian government to date. Um, so they're creating a, um, a, a version of their test um, that will include Rhino Swab Junior. So it'll be a rapid antigen test for children. Uh, and again, that will be primarily to government. And the minimum commitment uh, is to 22 and a half million Rhino Swab Juniors uh, over 24 months. Uh, so we start shipping the first uh, 500,000 swabs uh, to BTNX in Canada in, in July. So it's a great partnership that we have there. And we're thinking that certainly, um, uh, certainly it would be a very similar story with partnering with a Japanese rapid antigen test uh, maker. And I note in the press recently, uh, Japan had started to have some uh, manufacturers of rapid antigen tests um, uh, recently. So that's the sort of partnership uh, that we we would um, be interested in with Japanese companies, whether we can partner with them to create uh, a more child friendly test uh, for 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 the Japanese market. There's many other segments as well. Uh, so the rhino swab, the adult rhino swab, is very suitable for other areas such as excuse me, aged care. You can imagine. Uh, in the aged care market, you want something that is very, very comfortable uh, for, for the aged care market. And that, that could be <coughs> a key market for, uh, for Japan. So please, if you have any interest, um, be very happy to talk to you about uh, a partnership around RhinoSwab, but also uh, around using our platform for either drug delivery, which is, is a different story altogether, um, but one that we have uh, some innovative solutions, so nasal drug delivery, uh, but also diagnostics um, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. Um, I'll take a box of the moustaches, I think. I love the concept and, uh, and functionally fantastic. Just before we move on to our next speaker, I just wanted to remind everyone about... Um, uh, Oz MedTech has been on this week, fantastic opportunity, but also they're already for the MedTech conference being held in Boston in October, October 24 to 26. The Team Australia, all states will be there and already 25 Australian companies have signed up for the Australian Pavilion. So the Japanese um, uh, participants today who are traveling perhaps to Boston, now there's an opportunity to do so. Um, please go to the Australian Pavilion at, at um, the MedTech conference to see a lot more of this type of opportunity. Okay, uh, I'd like to move on now to our next presentation from Prospection. Uh, Kaoru Sato, the Director of Custom, Customer Success, Country Manager, Japan for Prospection um, from New South Wales. I'd like you to hand over to you, please. Thanks, Adam. Um, well, let me share with you my screen.
Thank you for your patience. Well, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm glad I have an opportunity here to share with you overview of our business today. Uh, I'm Kaoru Saro from Prospection. Um, Prospection is a health data analytics, analytics company headquartered in Sydney. I'm based in Tokyo to head up the business in Japan. When we go to see a doctor at a hospital or a clinic, we generally expect the drug we receive should be effective to us. The drug would not cause a side effect to us. This is general expectation as a health consumer. What is actually happening is, a medicine would be effective for 60% of the patients who received it. It may cause an adverse event to 10% of patients. For the rest 30%, no clear efficacy. How do you feel like about this? When I was a student of a pharmaceutical school in Tokyo, it was like the 30% uh, of one third, one third, and one third. So it may look better now, but we do not have to stop seeking a better solution for our own health. Many of you have heard the word biomarker. PSA is a biomarker that is closely monitored in patients with prostate cancer. As PSA starts to rise, this is an indication things are not going so well and the disease may be spreading to another site. Collectively, collectively we can explore and compare the time it takes for cancer to metastasize across different drug, uh, uh, different drug groups at each individual patient's outcomes of, on different drugs. In this image on the left-hand side of the slide, each of these black lines represents a patient's PSA score in the patient data. Using the speed of technology, we run the analysis to form clusters based on different treatment histories. Examining patient types, we can see when treated with a particular drug, how well the patient did. Did the PSA score in fact, in fact go down or go up? In this chart, you can see drug A and drug C both have strong reduction in PSA, and this is sustained for a period prior to gradually increasing. Whereas drug B does not have a strong PSA reduction on its own. Using the healthcare big data is an area of interest for academia, government, local and national, health insurance associations, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, and insurance companies. We can help those parties use the healthcare big data efficiently and effectively. There are challenges such as accessing data, it is important to find an appropriate technology solution. Creating value from the data is desired both medically and commercially. Well, Prospection was founded 10 years ago in Australia. Uh, Cicada Innovation. We now have offices in Sydney, Tokyo, Seoul, UK, and we are expanding internationally. And we are working with most of the top 30 global pharmaceutical companies. And our founders are the licensed experts as well as innovative leader. So they are um, driving our business to serve um, healthcare companies uh, across the world.
So we are uh, doing our business on these four key pillars. First, uh, we provide the uh, patient insights using real world data. As you may be aware, uh, most of the uh, clinical, uh, most of the uh, medical products are going through the clinical trials. However, due to the limitation of the number of the patients in the clinical trials, we have only limited knowledge about the efficacy and the uh, uh, adverse events. So it's important for us to use real world data so that we could understand the real value of the product. And the patient, fi patient uh, findings in, um, sorry, patient findings in rare and misdiagnostic, misdiagnosed therapy areas to improve, di improve diagnostics is other areas of our concern. We also work with medical teams to publish real world evidence on treatment and drug effectiveness. Finally, we work to get all these insights into the hands of medical practitioners to provide evidence decision support. Prospection is contributing to realization towards precision medicine in future. By using our technology, stakeholders will get better outcome of their treatment. We will put the right pay on the right treatment at the right timing. So here, let me share with you an example of predicting the next best treatment for each patient based on their history. Once we understand the patient characteristics and their connection to outcomes on different drugs, we are closer to a formula for precision medicine. We are able to predict the next best action to take for different patient archetypes. Each one of the colored dots on the chart on the left represent a patient. We form clustering of these events to find identifiers for patient types of archetypes. In this case, we can see the patient type one have more patients who survived longer after two years than patients treated with drug A or drug C. In this case, patient type one might be treated with drug B for best possible outcomes. Likewise, if we look at patient type eight and nine, these patients may have better outcomes on drug C. We can see that different patients are more suited to different drugs and we can find the best patients for the drug leading to better overall performance of different drugs. Please let me summarize who we are, what we do, what benefits we can bring, bring to the society. Prospection is a data analytics company founded in Australia 10 years ago. Our advanced predictive algorithms use real world data to assist our pharmaceutical clients, medical device clients, and healthcare professionals find patients, transform previously hidden real world data into publication greater evidence, provide valuable patient insights via timely evaluation of treatment interventions, and translate real world data into meaningful clinical interventions. Our extensive experience with data sets from around the globe has positioned us uni uniquely we are able to rapidly ingest and analyze data from all over the globe. Our algorithms scale easily, producing normalized insights for your business, and it can do this across multiple regions. As a third-party 
uh, as a third party, third party data partner, we are committed to ensuring the security of the data we use and have strict governance policies are being continually reviewed and strengthened to ensure full compliance with the regulations in all the countries in which we operate. This slide takes us to the end of my presentation. I look forward to seeing you again to discuss more. Thanks for your attention. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Sato-san. That's excellent. Um, very interesting from prospection. Um, we might be a little bit behind, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Luke Sinclair, Podiatrist and Managing Director of Dola Orthotics in Queensland. Over to you, Luke. Hi, Adam. Thanks so much for the uh, for the invite to present here. I really appreciate it. I'll just uh, share my screen with you guys. Okay. Uh, now, Dollar Orthotics uh, provides worldwide access to our gold standard Australian foot healthcare. Uh, so who are we? We are a medical orthotics laboratory. Sorry, I'll just go back one. Uh, we're a medical orthotics laboratory uh, who is owned and operated by Australian podiatrists and we have over 50 years in clinical experience. Uh, our laboratory has up until this point in time has just been making custom orthotics for podiatrists and foot doctors around the world, uh, including in Japan uh, for, over 50, for over 25 years. Um, so first up, what are orthotics? Orthotics are medical shoe inserts uh, that go in your shoes and they help how you stand and walk. Uh, very, very similar to how prescription eyeglasses work to help your eyes. Uh, they can help reduce pain, improve posture, boost performance, and abs add support. Uh, the problem with the feet is that the feet are the foundations of the body. Uh, you got 85% of people in the world don't have straight feet, uh, and this can affect your entire body, which can affect your work, your life, sports, day-to-day -day activities, and, and your health and happiness. Uh, there's a lot of costs, obviously, that are incurred with this, including your medical costs, uh, time away from work, school, things like that. Uh, the areas that, that your foot alignment can really affect are predominantly further up the chain. So they can be obviously from having poor foot alignment, flat feet, things like that. You can have pain in your feet, uh, sore legs, uh, pain in your knees, which can lead to arthritis and things like that. Uh, pain in your hips and also pain in your lower back as well. So the issue that we have is we've been making orthotics for medical professionals to help all of these problems. And we noticed that's great in certain countries, uh, but in a lot of countries, people just don't have the access to these foot specialists. So we're constantly being asked when we're overseas, you know, where do I go to see these specialists? How can I see one of these foot doctors? How can I get some orthotics to help myself or my children or my older parents or something like that? Um, the, the issue with that is, is obviously just the specialty in, in terms of itself. Uh, and it's also in a lot of countries where um, access to these special, specialists is possible, then you've got issues as well with the costs uh, and the time involved with going to see these professionals as well. So taking time off work, taking time off school, traveling, things like that as well. Uh, so our new product is called Levo Prescription Orthotics and we use uh, footage to fix feet. So this is a, a direct to consumer offering where instead of us just making orthotics for uh, medical health professionals, we're now offering our services and our, our professionalism and our experience direct to the, to the public so they can help a lot more people around the world. Basically what it is, is an online platform which allows uh, customers from, from different countries, different languages um, to be able to, to jump onto our platform. This can also be incorporated into kiosks or into footwear retail stores, anything like that. So uh, interesting number of options that we can, we can work with, uh, with, uh, with different people in different countries, depending on, on, 
probably the most efficient way to, to get into that market. Uh, basically, the premise is just answer a few questions. So this is very, very similar to as if you're visiting one of our clinicians in a, in a clinic in Australia. You know, tell us whereabouts it's sore, if it's your foot, if it's your ankles, uh, sore knees, hips, back, things like that. Uh, now, here's the key part is that you're just going to upload a, a short video. So with everybody now being very... Um, very good with their phones and being able to take short videos and uploading them, TikTok, things like that, very, very popular. Uh, we're using this sort of technology to then be able to, to take a, a video of yourself walking up and down, um, just in a hallway, just at home from the comfort of your home. And all of this information will then go through to our trained medical uh, professionals and they will assess uh, the way that you're standing and you're walking um, and obviously all of your questions, just, just exactly like you had a, a consultation with one of our doctors uh, in Australia. So you being able to provide world leading um, healthcare direct to, to anybody's home, um, anywhere in the world uh, and, and at a very, very good price as well. Uh, so what we're basically doing here is providing the prescription orthotics and the exercise plan. So this is gonna be prescribed by the podiatrist who's viewing the video and, and reading your your, um, your answers to your questions. So it's, it's that kind of clinical assessment. Uh, they'll be then prescribing the exact insole that needs to go into your shoes um, and a, a custom exercise program. And they'll be sending that to you. Um, those inserts just go straight into your shoes. So if you've just got a normal pair of walking shoes, you just take the insoles out of them, replace them with these orthotics and all of a sudden you're walking a lot straighter. Uh, this will enable you to enjoy all the benefits that balanced feet bring to your life. Um, so this can keep you staying active, healthy and happy and you can avoid problems later in life. Um, and that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm, I, might, I might actually have to uh, contact you directly about my feet problem. <laughs> it looks very interesting indeed. Okay, no, look, I, I just, just wanted to give a, a brief outline, obviously, and keep it quick in, in terms of what we're doing. So, you know, if there's anyone Excellent. obviously interested, we can go into more detail later on. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks, Adam. And just before we move to the next speaker, I'd, I'd just like to um, re-emphasize some of the um, national level collaborations we have. Of course, everyone knows about the fantastic work of Jetro. Um, that's helping us today. Uh, the Australian equivalent Austrade, also heavily involved in working as the Team Australia for, in this ecosystem. And one more, MTP Connect, uh, which is a not-for-profit organisation designed to help speed up the commercialization of opportunities in this, this and other medical areas. I recommend that you have a close look at their website and we will happily provide introductions to all three going forward. Okay, let's move now to South Australia. For Citec 3 d I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark Rowe, the Chief Executive Officer. Over to you, Mark. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's certainly an honour to be here today and present uh, to all the stakeholders. Uh, if you bear with me, I'll uh, bring up my screen. Okay, I hope everybody can view this. Um, <clears throat> FuseTech is a uh, successful advanced manufacturing company servicing the healthcare sector. Uh, we've won multiple awards and Mark contracts. Sun. Mark Sun, your slides are not shared. Okay. Uh, Sharing thing. Sorry. 
Hopefully that has resolved the problem. And sorry about that. Uh, so a few seconds an advanced manufacturing company uh, been quite successful winning many awards, contracts and exporting around the world. Uh, FuseTech's mission is to improve healthcare outcomes by providing safe, affordable and effective uh, training models to upskill surgeons and residents uh, by continually advancing surgical training. Uh, we're very much an IP-centric company, uh, continually innovating uh, for commercial reasons. Um, the business was founded for the sole reason or to answer the research question how do surgeons train? Traditionally, uh, surgeons train on cadavers. They've been the cornerstone of surgical training since the 17th century. Uh, but cadavers are problematic, uh, very difficult to, uh, to source. They can be expensive, limited to the pathology that you can order a cadaver in. Uh, potentially infectious, and all cadavers are treated as infectious. Um, also, cultural reasons, very hard to get cadavers in some countries, and there is a global shortage right now of cadavers. Uh, FuseTech products is, uh, we believe, the solution uh, where our products are easily shipped and transported around the world. Uh, we can create pathology on demand. They are low cost, they have no regulatory burdens, no ethical issues, no harmful bacteria. Um, FuseTech uh, has already existing collaborations with many tier one global medical companies. Uh, we're exporting to USA, England, Germany, uh, around uh, around Europe and the South Pacific. Uh, we're even uh, exporting some products to Japan. Uh, I'm about to share you a video uh, that will so, show or demonstrate two surgeons in Adelaide uh, doing surgical training with Hokkaido University in Japan. So how this works is we manufacture the products in Adelaide. We've shipped the products to Japan. Uh, we might have 10 or 20 uh, surgeons in a room in Japan, and we're doing the instructions here from Adelaide. So every model, every surgeon will start with the same model. Uh, we'll do the teaching, then they all get the second model and the third model. Uh, I'll start that video. I think a picture says a thousand words there. We're uh, collaborating with uh, universities around the world to assist with surgical training. I have two other videos here, uh, but I won't play them now uh, to help speed up time. Uh, the first one is a collaboration that we've done with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it is not a, uh, we've designed a product here not to teach surgical training, but to teach them how to use robotics in surgery. Uh, I'll just move forward. Uh, what's happened is uh, technology has advanced to a point that FuseTech has recently opened the world's first advanced surgical training clinic. Uh, it's a 25 bed surgical clinic based here in Adelaide. Uh, and in fact, I'm sitting in it right now. Uh, and we have surgeons here on a daily basis doing dissections on different parts of human anatomy uh, from wrists and shoulders and knees uh, to gynecology, to ears, to noses. Uh, we're continually developing more products 
and we feel that this is a way in the future we'd certainly love to open a, uh, a an advanced surgical training clinic in japan and uh, we'd love to do that in collaboration with the university uh, in japan uh, if you uh, are interested in our products or our surgical training please feel very welcome to uh, uh, contact myself uh, my email is on the uh, screen right now and um, I'd like to conclude by saying thank you very much. It was an honour. And this is my last slide. Uh, back to you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That's, that's also very interesting indeed. Um, and just goes to show you that every state that uh, you hear from today, every state from Australia has some wonderful med tech opportunities. Um, next, I'd like to move to West Australia. Argenica Therapeutics uh, will be introduced by Dr. Liz Dallimore, who's the Chief Executive Officer. Over to you, Liz. Thanks very much, Adam. I will just quickly share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can now all see, see the screen. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present the Argenica Therapeutics story. We are an ASX listed company with the ticker AGN. So I've just got a, a quick disclaimer on forward-looking statements in this presentation. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the company, we are a, a drug development company. We're pre-clinical stage at the moment, looking to move into a phase one clinical trial, trial for our lead drug candidate. So we're looking to develop best in class novel neuroprotective therapeutics so these are peptide drugs that are able to protect brain cells following stroke and other types of brain injury. Our lead drug candidate is ARG007, and we've got quite a number of preclinical efficacy studies showing how this drug protects brain cells following stroke predominantly, but other types of brain injury. The drug itself has spun out of two West Australian research institutions, so the Perrin Institute and the University of Western Australia. And uh, to move into our phase one clinical trial, we are partnering with Linear, which is a Perth-based, West Australian-based clinical trial facility. We have uh, our patents granted in the EU, Japan, China, and the US, and they are 100% owned by the company now. So just to give you a quick overview of the, the capital structure. So as I said, we're listed, we have around 73 million shares on issue and we have cash in the bank of uh, just over 4 million, which is enough to get us through to the end of our phase one clinical trial. So why are we going after stroke? Stroke is a huge global issue. So a massive market, uh, one in four people will suffer a stroke in their lifetime. These patients, um, there's a high death rate, but for those that survive, they have long-term disability, lasting brain damage. And there's a saying in, in stroke research that time is brain. So for every minute um, that treatment is delayed, 1.9 million brain cells die. And so what we're trying to do with our drug ARG007 is to protect those brain cells that are dying to buy that patient time to get to the hospital and get the treatments they need. So there are currently no universally available drugs that are able to do this to protect brain cells following a stroke. So what currently happens in stroke, just to give you a bit of an idea. So when the, the paramedic, the first responder arrives to a patient suspected of suffering a stroke, there's very little they can do. So the aim is to get that patient to the hospital as soon as possible to receive treatment. Um, it's really important though that that patient is diagnosed with the type of stroke that they've had. So around 85% of all strokes are caused by a clot in the brain. So that's termed an ischemic stroke with the roughly other 15% is a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleed on the brain. The treatments for these two different types of strokes are quite different. So many patients that suffer the ischemic stroke with the, the clot in the brain, they'll receive a clot dissolving drug. 
but that drug cannot be given to patients that suffer the bleed on the brain, the hemorrhagic stroke, otherwise it will exacerbate bleeding. That's why it's so important to diagnose a type of stroke. But the time it takes from the paramedic arriving to the patient coming to hospital to getting the diagnosis, you're getting increasing amounts of brain cell death. So what we're aiming to do with our drug is that it can be given in the field by paramedics to protect brain cells from that cell death that, uh, that you have that cascades out as the delayed time to treatment occurs. So it's buying those patients more time um, to get to hospital and to get the treatments they need. So how does it work? So with an ischemic stroke, so that's with the clot in the blood vessel, there's an initial infarct area. And as every minute of delayed, um, delayed treatment, you're getting this cascade of cell death that proliferates out from that initial infarct. And so whilst no drug can actually stop that initial infarct injury, what ARG007 does is it works on multiple mechanisms of action that stop that cascade of cell death that happens after the initial injury. So it's um, preserving that still viable, that still salvageable brain tissue. So we have a quite extensive preclinical data in stroke, um, but also traumatic brain injury and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, we have 24 peer reviewed publications looking at this drug, um, which is really exciting. So we're de-risking the drug um, as much as we possibly can before going into phase one clinical trials. So the results are really encouraging to date in our preclinical studies. We see a 67% reduction in brain tissue death um, in non-human primate studies, and that effect is lasting out to 28 days. We know that our drug can be administered in the field because it doesn't exacerbate bleeding in hemorrhagic stroke patients. And all the preclinical work that we have done to date um, shows that there's no adverse effects in terms of safety, toxicity, and the pharmacokinetic data that we're collecting. So where are we at at the moment? Uh, so uh, you can see all our announcements uh, through the ASX. We've recently announced the completion of our um, safety and toxicology studies and our final pharmacokinetic studies. So these are the preclinical studies that we need to do to allow us to get into our phase one clinical trial in humans which uh, we anticipate will be in the second half of this calendar year. So what are we doing in our phase one clinical trial? It's really a safety trial. So it's in healthy volunteers. So it won't be in stroke patients, but healthy volunteers that will come into linear. We are looking essentially evaluating the safety of the drug, determining the ideal safe dose and ensuring that there's no adverse reactions. This Clinical trial itself is what's termed a dose escalating trial. So it will um, be run through four cohorts of healthy volunteers. Each cohort will have eight participants with six receiving our drug and two receiving a placebo. Um, the first cohort will come in and once we deem that that cohort is safe at that dose, we'll escalate the dose and bring the second cohort in and so on and so forth. And we'll be releasing to the market um, those dose escalations as we go. So when the patients come in, they stay at linear for around 48 hours. Um, we collect uh, data in terms of the safety profile, we collect bloods, those sorts of things. And then um, they come back at day eight for further data collection. So the entire timeline is estimated to be around six months. Um, and so we'll, we'll wrap that up towards the end of this calendar year. And once we under finalize our phase one, this is when we move into our phase two study in actual stroke patients. So again, looking at the safety of our drug, um, but predominantly, um, and then with some, some exploratory endpoints around how it's actually working in stroke patients. Is it reducing the infarct volume? Is it having an effect? Um, so we've got a really well-placed team to deliver on this. Um, and I'll just quickly move on. So just to wrap up um, in terms of the final slide. So the company itself, we've got a really clear pathway through to our phase one clinical trials. We're addressing a huge unmet clinical need. 
It's off the back of extensive amounts of preclinical data. So we're de-risking the drug in terms of safety, but also efficacy as much as possible, led by an exceptional team and some really exciting near-term catalysts coming up as we move into our phase one clinical trial, but then beyond as we start building out our phase two trial in stroke. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, indeed, very interesting. Um, I'd next like to introduce uh, Junji Shimada, the Consul General of Japan in Melbourne, to make some closing remarks. Thank you, Junji. Hi, Adam. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Junji Shimada, Consul General of Japan in Melbourne. And um, I would like to thank all of, all of you for participating in today's webinar. The time is running, uh, so but the uh, um, this webinar is a new initiative to uh, to connect promising Australian nice. companies <laughs> with Japanese companies and investors, and to achieve innovation through exchange between Australia and Japan. And today's webinar was on the subject of medtech and life science. And the thank you very much for the uh, uh, Miss Connie Christophe to provide the comprehensive picture view on the uh, medtech and then uh, life science and in Victoria and Australia. And I would like to thank all the companies from the five states with for their Excellent, excellent presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm very much impressed by today's presentation. And I would like to, personally, I would like to contact some of them uh, as Adam Tosh. Uh, but anyway, um, presentation was on the, uh, the variety of the advanced medtech, recognition of important, uh, recognition of the importance of human and machine collaboration is growing rapidly. I myself have a small um, brain stimulation, uh, stimulation device installed in, in my body and in my head. So I, really do appreciate such modern forms of technology. Today's webinar is critical to advance medtech in a speedy, effective, and efficient manner. Both Japan and Australia have a high level of medtech medical care with the potential for further development through cooperation between companies in these two countries. We hope today this webinar will lead to tangible results like many business matchings and concrete investment with Japan. Finally, I would like to thank the Victorian state government, Invest Victoria and other four state government for hosting this webinar, as well as Jetro Takahara-san for their cooperation and the J Bridge initiative. I would also like to thank AJBCC and Innovation Dojo for promoting and supporting the initiative. And thank you very much for Adam and as MC. And, and also I should not forget to, to tell you about that. I'd like to sincerely thank my good and great offer Kali who possesses enormous passion for strong Ichigo relationship. Council General of Japan in Sydney, Kiya-san. And I am looking forward to seeing this webinar series continue to grow. Thank you very much for your time today. Shimada-san, thank you so much for that. 
Um, I'd just like to wrap up quickly so that we can be on time and thank each of the companies for their presentations. Um, and just to let you know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have so many excellent new companies. I'd also like to point out that we had Victorian, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australian and West Australian companies today. All of those states have commissioners in offices in Tokyo, and I would recommend that you start and by contacting all of the state offices to find out the opportunities across Australia because every choice from Australia is a good choice in terms of med tech. So everyone, thank you very much for your time today. Please contact us. Please contact us through Jetro or through Austrade or through directly through the state offices. And we'd be delighted to introduce you to collaboration, to investment and to trade opportunities in med tech in Australia. Thank you very much.